the future. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the congratulations to the 47th president of the United States, Dr. Cornell West. I'm Tracy. I'm going to let my guest introduce himself in just a moment. This is a different format. This is a different format um, than we normally do. Normally we go live, but I had two interviews in one month. So one had to be live. That was last week. I didn't want to do two in a row because then people would expect people to come on every week. And so far, I can't find enough people to come on every week, which I would love to change. So if you're, if you are a supporter of Dr. West, please email me at tracymediallc at gmail.com and we can get you scheduled to come on. I promise it'll be an easy conversation. Um, before we get started, um, again, there will be no mention of my website. The only website we want you to go to is CornellWest2024.com. That's the only website you'll need to know. That's the only website we're going to talk about. So let's get it started and let, I'm going to let my guest introduce himself. Hi, I'm Jose Camacho. And I was persuaded to come on to your show by my partner, Robin. And it's very discombobulating that I'm even doing this, but I think I just finished telling people, we have to try to do things differently on a personal level. So getting out of my comfort zone on your show is part of that. You know? So usually the way this show has worked is I talk about five things that I've heard about Dr. West running for president. We talk about those a little bit. We'll obviously go off track a little bit because that's just the way the conversation ends. And so before I get to those things, can you briefly talk about why it is that you support Dr. West? I think if I get down to the nitty gritty, I really feel as a lifelong Democratic, Democratic Party voter, my entire life, um, I don't have a choice. I, I think I have been booted out of the Democratic Party by their insanity, um, by the utter lack of integrity, by the this, uh, it's clear now in this Biden administration, it is just incapable as an institution to be honest, to address people's needs in an honest way. And I think it's reached a level of, you know, the emperor has no clothes craziness. It's insane. Um, I actually reached that conclusion, you know, I think right after I voted for Biden and saw that really he just didn't act, have it in him to act with integrity. And instead of the luminaries of the party saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, instead we just got silence from all the Democrats around him. And I realized, wow, we're in trouble. This is really going to happen. So Cornell West, to me, is my reason to have hope as much of a sliver as it is cornell is just a man who has the integrity the intellectual and uh, spiritual roots to even stand up and say you know I, not just you know i'm going to be a leader i want to be on the political stage just because that would be cool and I get to pat myself on the back. Um, I think he is doing it because he has always stood for integrity in matters of thinking, in matters of you know society. It's always been integrity with him. When Obama was president, he was you know one of a handful of luminaries, people with a name in the you know public square who would say. Okay, why, why do we never hear about poverty in this administration? Of all the uh, sound bites we get, the, the great sounding rhetoric we get, 
we never hear the word poverty as if it didn't exist. And his argument, you know, in his typical style was if we act like something it doesn't exist, if we never talk about something, we are not even at the beginning of trying to solve a problem if we don't say this is a problem. And so that's, you know, and when he was saying this, you know, to my shame, I am a, an old time, you know, I'm 62, I'm an old time scoured, vote blue, no matter who, democratic voter, even before they came up with that dumb phrase. Oh, Cornell West has been talking this idea of intellectual integrity, spiritual integrity from way back. And, you know, they always talk about lived experience. My lived experience is I have been a loyal Democratic Party. I have embraced the idea, as a Puerto Rican, I have embraced the idea of civil rights, that there was hope for us to make progress in our society. I felt for all the Democratic Party propaganda that we we do wear the white hats, that we do stand for, you know, Martin Luther King's dream. Uh, and what we see when we actually look at the evidence, when we actually look at the history, we have to conclude, and Cornell West concluded it long before I was even aware of that. He's concluded and the, the history books conclude that it, what we get is a lot of wordsmithing, messaging, propaganda. We get a lot of vir virtue signaling. But when we look at the policy, the results of actual policy, not just the words, but the actual policy, what we get is a permanent underclass. We have a 1% oligarchy. It's just a real thing. We, to say otherwise is, you know, fact denialism. So for me, Cornell West is kind of a godsend to me. Um, you know, unlike my beloved partner who could actually tell you in detail what his platform is, I know that Cornell West is a man of personal and intellectual integrity. And he's, you know, he stands for the right things and he always has. I think he probably put his hat in the ring because he doesn't have a choice. I think he looks out there as I do, and we realize we're living in crazy town. You know, we have a president now who, who really reluctantly was the hope of a lot of different demographics in this country. And because we had no choice, people like me thought, well, we got to vote for him. Maybe he will actually change from what he was in the past. He made so many promises. There was a lot of stagecraft in the Biden campaign in the Democratic Party. Eventually, uh, Bernie Sanders joined in that stagecraft. Um, you know, but the evidence is in now, and I feel, I I feel it's it's barely even a matter of party platforms or political stances. You know red versus blue, you know, liberal versus conservative. I think it's a matter of integrity now. Uh, there is an entire body of black intellectual thought. The Democratic Party really makes a big deal. They make millions of dollars draping themselves in the skin of people of color, right? If I'm your ally, I see you, I hear you. And yet, the intellectual work of all these scholars of color, you actually never see it reflected in a real way in the Democratic Party stances. And that's what, oh, sorry, um, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you, you hit the nail on the head when you said that, because I mean, he has a list, Biden has a list of things that he promised never delivered on and when you point that out to people oh well you just want trump we only have one president at a time when trump was president he was terrible 
Biden continued his policy. Tell me the difference because I don't, I personally don't see it. But the first thing I want to get into, the first lie that I want to get into, and I hope you read the Forbes article um, because I'm going to be referencing it a lot, um, is this whole notion of now is not the time for Dr. West to run. We have arguments, and I've literally heard people say this, well, you know, at times like this, when the Republicans are an existential threat, and my question or my thought is, okay, you see them being a threat in office, but when they're in office, you you, you make all of this, you know, protest, like when Trump was president and the children were in cages. We all agreed that should not be happening. But when you went silent, when Biden continued the exact same policy, where are you saying it's okay when Biden does it because he's not Trump? Are, are, are Democrats really saying that? I yeah, it's it really is an issue that's almost traumatic for me because I live that I you know I'm I'm a, a big slug. I grew up in Chicago in a steel mill neighborhood. We just assumed we if, if we didn't make it through high school, we could just go straight to the steel mill. And so those are actually my roots. Um, I lived to about 30 years of age as a worker getting by. And I realized I needed to do something different because I have a baby and I want to be able to talk about interesting things. So I found my way and I'm a high school dropout, right? So I have no credentials. Um, so I found my way to work in a law firm. And from that point on, from 30 years to you know, now I'm you know, just over 60, the people I tend to talk to professionally and work with are lawyers. These are professional thinkers. These are people who in court get punished if they tell a lie, if they fabricate, if they omit a fact, if they omit a point of law, a precedent in front of a judge, they get punished. They can theoretically get thrown in jail for contempt of court. They can be sanctioned by a money fine. They can lose a bit of their uh, reputation. They can get their license suspended. So these are my, these are, this is my circle of democratic friends, right? And what you just posed is, you know, you, you say during Trump era, this is horrible. This is bad. How can you treat people this way? When Biden gets up on the presidential stage and really he is perpetuating way, way, way too many of Trump policies to disregard there for basic humanity. It's stunning. I have gone to my Democratic Party attorneys and doctors, associates, these are highly educated people, people on the top part of the social economic ladder of the US. Um, they have given up, these are elites, these are thinkers, they have given up the idea of arguing with integrity. Instead, what I see, I lift it, what I see is silencing and shaming so you must want Trump to get into office. Um, so you must want, you know, uh, fascism in the country. And, and unfortunately, you know, media propaganda, like the Forbes article, it, it's nothing new. We already, we already did that. We already lived it. That, that's the same kind of vote blue, no matter who type of argument we had, you know, four years ago. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. my, that, yeah, go my, ahead. I'm sorry. My, my thing when I realize we are in trouble because all my highly paid elite professional thinkers, the people who walk around with this idea that truth matters, remember that? Truth matters. As a Puerto Rican with uh, kinfolk who are disabled, 
one of the things I could say about Biden was, okay, he's made an explicit promise to disabled Puerto Ricans on the island of Puerto Rico, which is a colony of the US, is that he would basically extend SSI disability benefits to the disabled on that island. I used to be a um, um, representative for the disabled in Chicago. I would represent them before administrative law judges. I would compose arguments that this person should qualify for disability benefits. So that, that's, that was my background for part of my professional life. Um, so what Trump did, eventually we got a, a judge with Puerto, Rick, Puerto Rican ancestry, Galfi. He decided this is citizenship apartheid. That's what Judge Galfi said. Why aren't we as a nation extending the safety net to Puerto Ricans? He had a great opinion. This was 2019. No, I think it was actually earlier. Um, so Trump appealed the progeny of Judge Galfi's decision. Judge decided, no, no way, I can't let you know, these freeloaders on the island get the same kind of disability benefits that the rest of America does. Uh, so that was not surprising for Trump to do. I could go on any Facebook feed of any of my old associates or friends and see, you know, 20 articles about how horribly Trump was treating Puerto Rico, right? So when Biden was elected and I was one of his voters, after having made these explicit promises to disabled Puerto Ricans, to Puerto Rican families on stage, on his website, you know, I, I recorded them, I have video excerpts. He did really make this promise. I will, I will stop the Trump vendetta against Puerto Ricans, in particular disabled Puerto Ricans. I believe disabled Puerto Ricans deserve the American safety net. He got into office and I have tracked them. One after another, Puerto Rican representatives, government official, uh, the attorney general of New York, uh, AOC. It's a whole list of Hispanic association, I think the Hispanic Federation. There are all kinds of community groups, organizations, social justice groups that basically appeal to Biden. Hey, what about your promise to the disabled Puerto Ricans? They're still suffering on that island. It's a devastated nation, culture. The worst off of these people who are the worst off in the US. Uh, I mean, they have a poverty rate that's much worse than Mississippi, which is a state in the US that is the most poverty stricken. Um, everyone appealed to Biden. So what, do, what, what are you waiting for? Please keep your promise to stop this Trump appeal that we can proceed with extending disability benefits to the disabled on the island. About 15% of which, I think that's a low figure, but 15% of those disabled are children. Cerebral palsy victims, you know, uh, people who are never going to be able to work in their entire life, starting from childhood on. Um, so everyone waited, everyone begged him, and he did nothing until finally uh, six months into his first year as uh, president. He came up with this reasoning, this pretext that because of a Department of Justice practice, they are obligated to defend any constitutional argument against a United States uh, policy or statute. I'm a legal research a researcher. It's what I do for a living. Um, I'm other attorneys hire me to to without a partisan outlook to just find the objective truth where the law stands on any given issue. So DOJ practice, I already knew off the top of my head that Obama abandoned the so-called practice, DOJ practice, when he came out and said, you know, the United States is not going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. So Obama, despite this supposed DOJ practice, decided we are not going to defend this discriminatory statute. 
So Obama let this appeal at the time simply die. Well, Biden pretended that this DOJ practice had any actual weight as law. It doesn't. It's simply an informal policy, which administrations treat differently just on, on the basis of expediency. So it was a lie which is typical of Biden, it has turned out. He will point to something as an excuse, you dig into it and it turns out to be factually untrue or legally without a basis. And that's what he did with disabled Puerto Ricans. So what Biden did was he did nothing except lie. He allowed this Trump appeal to move forward when he simply could have withdrawn it. It would have been that easy. Pick up a phone, hey DOJ, withdraw the Trump petition in front of the Supreme Court. That would have stopped the Trump appeal in its tracks. And so what the law that would have stood, that would have existed at that moment, would have been the appellate decisions that said Puerto Ricans who are disabled on the island deserve, deserve SSI benefits. They deserve to at least live on a subsistence level to be qualified for a medical card, you know, to not have their lives shortened by 20 years because they're disabled. So we could have started the ball rolling, right? As part of this new resistance movement where we were all embracing people of color that we applauded because they were essential workers. He did nothing. And of course, the Supreme Court predictably came out in favor of Trump. And at this point, it is actually legal to deny disabled Puerto Ricans something that a disabled Mississippian, a disabled Alabaman, a disabled Illinoisan, you know, can get some relief from incapacity to work. Right? It, it, that's the yeah, that's the plan in the first place. And this that's why the whole this is not the time argument kind of infuriates me. Yes. Because if you think about what they're really saying. If you really think about what they're really saying, it's like they're saying they get to determine the time. Yeah. Like they're ignoring everything that I would say after Reagan and up to Biden, it just what well, we got Carter, so we got kind of a break. After Carter, terrible presidents, like all of them, just terrible and just got worse and worse and worse and worse. So yeah. when you bring up this now is not the time type of argument, you're saying a couple things. The first thing you're saying is I get to determine when somebody else gets to run. And a lot of, if you watch a lot of the commentary, a lot of these so-called progressives are really like, well, why is he running? Well, he's at least 35. He was born in the United States and he's lived in the United States 14 years. Those three things say he can run. How do you get to determine who runs? The other thing that infuriates me about this is this whole fear mongering thing, which kind of leads me into the next train of thought. The whole, and I know you've heard this from when you talk about Dr. West. And you put it like this. When I put something about Dr. West on my Facebook page, I'm guaranteed to get at least five people that say you're voting for Trump. At least, at least, at least five. At least five. And it's like, and when I come back and say, you know, I'm not scared of Trump. There's nothing about Trump that scares me. Well, he's going to do this and he's going to do that. And I'm like, well, name something he's done. He was going to build the wall. It didn't get built. He was going to put Hillary Clinton in jail. She is not. Um, he was going to give tax cuts to the middle class. He did not. This man literally does nothing he's going to say. And you want me to be so scared of him that I'm going to vote for somebody who I fundamentally, fundamentally, not just a little bit. Thank goodness I didn't vote for him because I'm like the dude. It started from him being a plagiarizer. And with all, I mean, he's plagiarized Joe, Jim Crow Joe, now he's genocide Joe. Thank goodness I didn't vote for him. But you want me to be so scared of Trump, who literally has delivered on none of his promises, that I'm going to vote for somebody you say, not I say. As you notice, most people say, oh, well, I'm voting for Joe Biden, but I don't really support him, which literally makes no sense to me because I, at minimum, want to vote for somebody I support, right? 
I at minimum want to say, hey, yeah, I support this person. He did this, this, and this, and this, this. Nope. I'm just scared of Trump. I wish they would say I'm scared of Trump and what he can do, which, again, he really did nothing he said he was ever going to do. But I want us to focus on that because I think that's a real that's a real thing when we go out and we talk about supporting Dr. West. Oh, he has great ideas, but Trump. That's the thing that I think we're going to have to, and not you, well, you, me, and all us Cordell West supporters, we're going to have to really address that because a lot of people think that they don't support Biden. Matter of fact, I was reading one study where it said 78% of his own party does not want him to run. 78%. That's a very, it might be, I might be like inflating the number, but I know it's more than 50. It might be somewhere between 60 to 78, somewhere in that field. Yes. Democrats, not me, because I never wanted him to run in the first place. Not, not me. Democrats, people like you that have voted Democrat, no matter who the candidate was, you voted Democrat, you stayed with the Democrat. This is them saying, we don't want this guy, but yet they will criticize you the moment you say, I'm not voting for Biden. Well, you must want Trump. No, if I wanted Trump, I would vote for Trump. I'm voting for Dr. West. Mm -hmm. it's, I have gotten that since before Biden was elected. I am a Biden voter. And I, I'll tell you, I have a thing. My argument before I voted for him, in the year before he was elected into office, when I would argue or talk to my friends and associates, you know, most of them in the, the legal community, is, you know, you're talking about vote blue no matter who, because we need to stop Trump. But my criticism of Biden should not be silent whether or not I vote for him. And eventually I did. The point of a democracy, the point of elections, it's that we discuss amongst ourselves what the facts are, what the policies are. We use our reason, we use our morality. When everyone pitches in in a country, right, that's political public discourse. And from that, the combined thinking and discussion is supposedly what underlies an election. Unfortunately, the professional thinkers, the elite of the Democratic Party have actually abandoned that idea. So they try to convince us that actually we need to be more clever than to try to come up with problem solving. We need to actually vote for people, they, they will argue, because the other side is worse, right? And I have found that to be a completely yeah, not on achievements, not on achievements like, hey, I did this, I did this, I did yeah. this, I did this. Nope, just fear, fear, fear. That's it. That's all yeah. literally that you have in. Here's, here's what is really happening underneath that kind of argument. Here's, I have spent a lot of time talking to, you know, the elite, the comfortable professionals who vote blue no matter who. A lot of time. Because as a as a arguer, as a person who composes arguments in front of judges, right? In order to get justice is what we do in this country. We argue. And so I have argued with all these neoliberal people who I would say they at least feel that they are well-meaning, that they are moral. And underneath the argument that you're describing that's based on fear, is this and because i have posed this question to them i will say so tell me what you would tell a disabled puerto rican in puerto rico how will you convince that voter that democratic party voter right or someone like me even i'm puerto rican i know i'm related to disabled puerto ricans on the island Tell me what to tell my kinfolk in Puerto Rico. Because it sounds like what you're telling me is to say, hey, never mind that Biden as a Democratic Party made promises to you to change your life, to give you a safety net. He 
he betrayed you. There's no way to get around that. He betrayed you. He broke his promise. So you're in the same boat you were when Trump was president. You have no disability benefits. You don't have the hope of having disability benefits, probably for a, a, a generation after you or two, this country even survives that long. So Democratic Party, establishment, neoliberal, what is the argument? Because you're going to have to tell them, my disabled kinfolk in Puerto Rico, take the hit. Continue to live in abject misery and poverty as a disabled person. Continue to live without basic medical care. Where if you need, because you need to live, if you need to see a, a specialist in Puerto Rico, if you're lucky, you'll get an appointment to see them a year in the future as a disabled person with no income to help you, right? This is subsistence income. So you, neoliberal, have to convince them, to live with that. Please tell Jose to keep voting for the next Democratic Party president. So when these corporatists, when these lawyers and doctors, right, when these elites tell uh, a person of color who's been betrayed by violence, but what about Trump? What they're really telling them is forget that your miserable life in poverty continues because Biden promised you something and he broke that promise that is supposed to be okay, please make me feel safe. As a lawyer, as a doctor, please, disabled Puerto Rican, make me feel safe. Please tell me. You're going to tell all your Puerto Rican kinfolk and friends to keep voting for Biden. Because that way, as a doctor and a lawyer who, who believes in the Democratic Party, I don't have to live in fear. So you're going to have to take the hit for me. Meanwhile, I get to go on vacation overseas. I have medical care. I have a, a 401k, you know, as a professional, I'm set. You, for Trump to get in office is not going to change the lived in experience of most of these elite Democrats. Yep. They, still, I, yeah. they still will go to work. They're still gonna have their investments, right? They're still gonna have a car. They're gonna have a roof over their head. It will not change your actual lives. Exactly. Yep. And I think that's, I'm so glad you brought that up about broken promises, because again, going back to now's not the time. And now I don't speak to doctors or professionals. I'm in the working class group because even people in the working class will tell you, oh, well, Trump's worse. I'm like, how? Well, January 6th. No, that's an extreme, that's an extreme example. Just because a few Republicans decide to act a dang old fool doesn't mean that if he doesn't win, he's not going to do that again. But what I always say, and I always make this argument, is name an issue that you're concerned about. For me, it's Medicare for all. How has Biden advanced that? He lied and said to students at HBCUs that if you have $125,000 in debt, he would forgive it. Oh my then God. He brought several rights leaders and they called him out and he basically sat there and berated them and asked them how dare they call him out on a promise that he made. Then, let's not forget about the $2,000 checks. And, oh, they were coming. They're on your way. They're in your mailbox. Oh, well, no. You actually got 600 under Trump. So what we're going to do, we're going to give you 1400 and let me not start talking about the $15. Let me backtrack. I'm going to talk about voters right first. I want every black person and I know you're not black, but it, it could, it could apply to anybody, but since I'm black, I'm going to just say it. I'm, we're going to get voters right. Do we have voters right? No, we don't. You couldn't do the thing that even, even I saw. The Democrats can't mess this up. There's no way that the Democrat Party can mess this up. Oh, yeah, they did. Crickets. No voters' rights, no George Floyd Act, no anything. And I just keep wondering, when is it going to be enough for people to wake up and say, you know what? This isn't working. And stop being so scared of a man that literally has done nothing he's ever, every threat Trump has ever made, he's never made good on. Never. 
Never in real. Maybe the Muslim ban, but that didn't last for like what, maybe six or seven months. Right. And then he had to like let them in because the court said, no, you got to let them in. I don't get it. I don't understand why people can't clearly see what we as Dr. West supporters say because it, it just, sometimes it makes me mad. If, I, if I'm just being really honest because I look at what people are talking about they're going through. They can't pay their bills. They're hungry. Rent is high. Utilities are high. This man that's president, and it's not all on the president per se because it has to go through Congress and then he signs or vetoes it. I got that. But what Biden doesn't do that I think Dr. West will do is use the bully pulpit. Yes. I don't know why, like all the last presidents, well, Trump, he kind of did. It's like they don't, either they don't realize what the bully pulpit is, they don't want to use it, which is where I think it is, or they were never for the ideas that they campaigned on. I think it's the last two. I don't think, you cannot convince me that Biden was for a $15 minimum wage. There's no way, you're never going to convince me. It's not going to happen. Don't try to tell me when eight Democrats vote against something and you say nothing. Ah, no, that's when you start calling people out. This, this is a sore subject for me because he had a window of maybe six months where I was waiting to see the evidence that he was going to try to be different from how he was in the past, that the Democratic Party would actually act with advocacy, with a certain degree of aggression for people like me, like actually fight. So the $15 per hour minimum wage was really important to me, right? Because uh, I am, I, I work for below minimum wage, you know, I did not become supposedly white collar until, you know, my 30th year of adulthood. So I have worked uh, piecework, you know, in laundries. Um, I have scraped by, so I understand. My, I have a, a, a stepdaughter who's African American, and I've seen her struggle all her life. Um, I have, you know, my two biological children are multiracial. And although they've done well, I cannot believe how hard they have had to work just to have, just to be near the so-called American dream. It is insane what they've been put through. So the minimum wage was a big deal for me. And when I, what I saw happening before my eyes, because I am a researcher, when this something happens, I will see what the objective truth is. And I actually think it's what we all should do, that we have a duty to do that. So when Biden simply didn't talk on the subject and people, black intellectuals, people of color, labor people started telling him, you need to start talking about the importance of this. And he didn't. Instead, he would send out feelers saying things like, well, you know, I'm looking at the situation and it looks like we're going to have a hard time pushing this through. So he would give these really tepid anticipatory defenses for failure, for a failure that he could see on the horizon. And then when the parliamentarian issued her non-binding personal opinion, it's not law, it's not binding, he started talking about, well, we're disappointed in her ruling. It's not a ruling, but we're going to respect the process, right? This is propaganda. This is a lie because the process always included that Kamala Harris as vice president had the power. No one could stop Kamala. She had the power to simply say, we are going to override the parliamentarian's decision that we can't include this provision in you know, the reconciliation bill. Oh, it's an excuse. And you know what, Absolutely. I'm gonna sound uneducated. I had no idea we had a parliamentarian. I didn't know it. I'm sitting here like, uh, what? Exactly. Uh, what did you say? Exactly. Thanks to the Democratic Party, I now know that Trump fired his 
parliamentarian until he got one that agreed. You mean to tell me Biden couldn't do the same? He couldn't right. do the same. Why? So, right. like I said, nobody's ever going to tell me that he was for $15 minimum wage. No. Never. No. You're not going to tell me because the, the eight Democrats, if, if if they have voted for it, and all the Republicans, people point out, oh, well, all the Republicans, they voted against it. So what you do is you send your canvassers because the Democratic Party does have them and to those communities and say, this person voted against you getting a $15 minimum wage. Problem is you had eight Democrats who probably Joe Biden convinced to vote nay. And that's how this didn't happen. Never brought it up again. Never said anything about mm -hmm. You know, it was all this, we're going to look into it. Um, that was the first couple of months of your administration. Now it's almost time for your re-election. Yeah. Yeah. How's that coming along? Because we off of 15. We are so past 15 now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we need to be where Dr. West says, 27, that's where we start. We're not starting at 15. 15 is back there someplace. Yeah, 15 absolutely. is cool, but no, we, we off of that now. I, I was looking around for uh, Kamala Harris's memoir. It's called something. Um, I say one thing and do another. That's what it's called. It, thank you. It should be called that. It, it should, should be. be should call, I say one. No, I'm the queen of worm salad. That's what her memoir should be called. She actually quotes MLK in her memoirs, and she quotes uh, MLK's condemnation of starvation wages. And she actually says in her book, which was came out during her campaign and right before her campaign, that minimum wage today is the same as the starvation wages that Dr. King denounced way back then in the 60s. So she, she took that, she took that party platform item and that's what it was, right? She took that and said, we have to do better. We can't do this. And then when she became vice president, basically by being nice to Biden and saying nice things about it, when she became VP, she literally had the power, you know, as, as a constitutional official, she cannot be fired by Biden. So she had the power, which she already indicated she believed in to fight for minimum wage. She could have simply announced Biden could not have stopped her. I'm for the minimum wage. This parliamentarian decision will be overridden by me. So we need to start talking about how we get it. And then Biden could have started getting on that bully pulpit and acting with emotion. You know, he talked about uh, his firewall, our African-American demographic. He could have actually fought for it in words. This is the most verbose president ever. He could got on that bully pulpit and basically preach to the country. This is something we really need, right? Um, we never, we never saw even a hint of that. Instead, he did this. He did this propaganda that it was all the parliamentarians' fault. And when you, and this is the other thing I keep saying. When you criticize the Biden administration and you say they literally did that, oh, well, you're for the Republicans. No, I'm telling you facts. Yes, all the Republicans voted against the $15 minimum wage. They're all creeps. That's why they did it. Yep. But if I flip that same coin, the Democrats are also creeps. Yes. They literally in their platform said we should have a wage. I forget their exact wording, but I don't. I know they don't use the word living wage, but they've always campaigned around this issue. Then eight of them say in, eh, and you don't call them out. Oh, well, that's not politically expedient. Who cares? Is do you believe in your party? Is that what you're there for? Or are you there for your people? Which yeah. one is like. Biden can't make up, well, one, I think every word that comes out of his mouth is a lie. I don't think he was ever for voters' rights. I don't yeah. think he was ever for a $15 minimum wage. I don't think he was for a $1,400. I don't even think he was for the $1,400 stimulus check. Right. 
I literally don't. I'm like, you can't convince me. You cannot convince me in some aspect that Biden is a better president than Trump because I don't see it. I see two terrible presidents, but if I had to pick, I'm not going to say Biden was better. He's not Trump. Right. But isn't he? Because he continued every single last policy that Trump had. Biden said, okay, children are still being kept in cages. I want everybody to understand that. We still have Haitians that are being deported back to Haiti that they right. is in terrible condition. Yeah. We still have an embargo against Cuba, and I'm still wondering what did Cuba do to the United States? They're just sitting there. They literally are just sitting there doing nothing. It, it, it just amazes me that people will look at the facts, say they don't support them, and still vote for them, and then expect things to change. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a non-thinking loyalty. And one of the criticisms of the Trumpers, right, is how could you vote for this guy? It was very typical for me when I spoke to Trumpers, many of whom are professionals. I, I had a veterinarian friend in particular who was a stalwart enabler, defender of Trump. I found it fascinating that you have educated people who were Trump supporters. And really what was underlying their support of Trump, they would say, and I, I believe them on this point, they would say, I know he's, he's this or that, he's an a-hole, blah, blah, blah. What they really liked about Trump is that he hated the Democratic Party and he used that hatred. So that's something they could get behind because they also hated the Democratic Party. So on this issue of hatred, that you brought up the Haitians, and I brought up uh, Biden's broken promises to Puerto Ricans. There is the Democratic Party as an institution has a long, unadmitted history of letting down people of color. It, it's just a fact. So every election, they talk up their allyship with people of color. Every election. And as we go, I've gone all the way back to Biden. There's this fan, just a fantastic African-American journalist from back in the Carter era. If we read the intellectuals, especially the intellectuals of color who surrounded each administration in the Democratic Party, we'll see criticism, we'll see facts, but they're always buried. So, Oh. Robinson was this incredible, just he was just such a, a man of stature, right? Just an intellectual, but a democratic establishment figure. Randall Robinson was arguing about how the Clinton administration was just trashing Haitian migrants. Clinton embraced Cuban exiles, right? And but if in the same situation. Uh, Haitian migrants came on our shores, or actually even just on the sea. He got the Coast Guard to intercept them and send them right back to the hell that Haiti was. Randall Robinson, as an African-American intellectual and actually a, a business giant, condemned that. Eventually, he went on a hunger strike to stop that. He did get Clinton's ear. So this argument that we have a discriminatory and hypocritical stance on migrants who are of color and migrants who are not, uh, or at least in the case of the Cubans appear to not be people of color, that, you know, that colorism, we're discriminatory. It, it's existed up, you know, way back to the Carter era, the Clinton era, it still persists. In, in Biden's first year, he had already deported in, in the hell of the pandemic, he deported more Haitians than the three previous presidential administrations combined. That's what he did in his first year. No one in the establishment calls him out on it. It's re usually just activist groups or uh, migrant, you know, social justice groups. There's a, a 
a group of attorneys who represent immigrants. Um, I think it's Alia. Um, so it's, it's not like we don't have the evidence in front of us. And here's the thing, it, it, emotion counts. Our experiences do count. Our evidence do count. Despair is a real thing. If, if, if Biden betrays disabled Puerto Ricans, and you, there's no justification for that. The Democratic Party loses a piece of its votership. If Biden makes a big deal about fighting for voting rights, and then he is barely a presence on the political stage when it can, comes time for him to get on that bully pulpit, when Biden says, you know, I'm going to make sure that HBCU students get, you know, debt relief, and then he does it, it, it transforms into something else. And it's like he never said those words. When Biden goes to Haitian events in their communities in Miami, Florida, and says, I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to be Trump. And then he actually outdoes in a level of depravity the, what three previous presidential administrations does. Biden actually beats the all-time record for how you persecute Haitians when he does that. The Democratic Party loses votership. So it, this is not a matter of ideology, ideology anymore. It's not even a matter of you got to keep Trump out of office. It is insanity. And so when you have voters who are Democratic voters, they look around them and they see they've been abandoned. That is despair. You do not get people in despair who have been betrayed by leaders to the polls. It is it is impossible for me to vote for Biden because I know that my disabled aunt was carried on the backs of her brothers in Puerto Rico just to get around because they were poor and disabled. That's how she lived her life until she came to the US. Um, this idea of Haitian migrants when Trump was in office, he would ship them back to a country ravaged by the pandemic. And they, some of them had COVID. So we were actually introducing COVID to that island. There was a time when someone asked the Biden administration, whoever was in charge of immigration, um, when we deport Haitian migrants back to Haiti, are we testing them to make sure that they're not, that they don't have COVID? And he says, well, we don't know. We're just following the law, you know, Title 42, we need to send them back. So we weren't even, we weren't even trying to be better than Trump in terms of no. making sure we weren't exacerbating the pandemic. Let all the black people not have COVID. I mean, that's uh, essentially what he's done. And yeah. I think that's, for me, I'm going to take this way, way, way back. Um, last year, I did a list of five people who I would want to see. I'm going to take it back even first. This last election, when Bernie literally got screwed twice, twice, I was like, this is it. I'm done. I cannot. Because I begrudgingly, and I'm saying begrudgingly, voted for Hillary. That's, a, that's one I'm just like, I can't even believe I did it. Be because I bought into it, right? But then when Biden ran, I'm like, mm -mm, nope, no, not going to do it. Not, not, there's no way. I won't do it. I said when he got elected, I'm going to vote for somebody that has a black forward policy. They don't have to be black themselves, but I'm going to make sure that reparations is somewhere in that discussion. I'm going to make sure that a living wage is somewhere in that discussion. I'm going to make sure that community banking is somewhere in that discussion. I'm going to make sure cutting the military budget by a significant amount is in that discussion. I'm going to make sure getting out of NATO is somewhere in that discussion. And I said, even last year, I was like, I think Dr. West meets those qualifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, now that he put his hat in the ring, even when he was with the movement for the white, I mean, movement for the people's party, I was still going to vote for him. 
I'm like, I'll vote for him and not necessarily them. Then he moved to the Green Party, and then finally he went independent, which I think was the better move. But I'm not going to get into that because that turns into a three-hour discussion. But I'm so happy to support somebody that I know as a Black American that will have Black Americans back. Right. I have... N- Obama certainly didn't because I feel like he threw black people under the bus. I'm just like, mm-hmm. okay, um, we can't we can't stop this whole discussion of renewing voters' rights. We gotta do it every 25 years. Why not just make it permanent? Mm-hmm. Let you ignore that. Right. Um Bush certainly didn't have the black agenda on his Trump didn't. No one has, and now I'm like, I have a candidate that I can say support everybody and that's really rare for me yeah i i mean there there's a phrase uh like has so in it like we're the night of the the so where where you're so in despair when you you're so hopeless that you start investigating everything like you start digging down to the roots of problems In, in my case even digging down to me like, why was I such a chump? Why did I believe that oh, the Democratic shoot. Party... I, I voted for Hillary, you voted for Biden. We were both done. <laughs> we, were both done. we just just went with them and said, okay. You know, when when I, I had to travel from one part of Illinois to Chicago to vote, I've always voted. Um, when I took a train to vote in Chicago for Biden, I waited to the last possible day. And when I got to the polls, I hung out at the polls. I did not want to vote for him. I actually was hoping that he would stroke out and that he, there somehow there would be a way to oh. in his place. It's a horrible thought, isn't it? But that's how much I hated the idea of voting for him, but I did because I did buy the vote blue no matter who to stop Trump. And because Biden is a human being, I think he's a degenerate, but he is still a human being. There is always the chance that a human can change because they look at the evidence, they look at the effects of their conduct in history, and they see that it has hurt people, and they change. So based on the sliver of hope that he might start turning things, if he just had kept his promises, I might have been able to say, okay, things are better than when Trump was in office, but he didn't. So in despair, I I told my neoliberal friends, we need to start looking at history so that we can come up with the arguments that the Democratic Party has always had in defending people of color and poverty-stricken people, the struggling working class. If we just go back to history, And I said this, and I actually did it, and I realized, holy crap, the Democratic Party actually is all talk. Because if you look at each administration, you know, from Carter to the present, it's always all been talk. Um, I'm actually holding this book because I actually feel like, come on, we all know what Martin Luther King stood for. Who could not support Martin Luther King, right? It should be part of the, the, the platform of any pro-people party, right? So I'm, I'm holding up this book, Why We Can't Wait by Martin Luther King. He is always cited as like our spiritual guru. If anyone wants to look like they're moral, you just say Dr. King's name and your stature increases and apparently you do wear the white hat. In this book, Martin Luther King is not talking about the doctrine of his church, right? He is talking about human decency. It is an economic stance. It is an economic justice stance. He's not talking woo-woo. He's not talking about let's be nice to everyone, all white people and black people and Puerto Rican. We just need to be nice to each other. He is getting down to the nitty gritty. He is saying for this country, to ever be what it says it is about, we need to give economic 
equity to everyone, and that includes Blacks. He's not a Black separatist. It was just about we need to understand that our system is built on predatory economic behavior where it is okay for people to barely get by or just to not get by. In this country, it is okay for people to live like that and we need to change it. 1963, he came out with this book. And when you look at the actual policies, not, not the wording, not the messaging, but the actual policies that have resulted from Democratic Party administrations. It just, it just hasn't happened, right? They all had their opportunities, even Jimmy Carter, you know, who I remember Jimmy Carter wearing his sweaters with his, you know, Southern accent. He seemed like a nice guy. When it came time to them to push for legislation that would change the system to finally give people of color some economic equity, uh, it just didn't happen. No window dressing. They were pass laws that actually meant nothing. They were passing them because the title sounded nice. Um, it just hasn't happened. When And after the pandemic, when we had the corporate guys in their suits clapping essential workers, you remember that? They will applaud essential workers, janitors and restaurant workers and people on the checkout line, you know, they finally started getting a lot of sound bites in their favor from the guys who wear suits and ties. Not a raid, though. They, I mean, it, 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 a, lot of, a lot of verbiage came out in favor of the working class. And yet, the first test of that, which was for minimum wage, um, it became just an opportunity to uh, massage and finesse the sound bites coming out of the White House. You didn't see any anger from Biden. You didn't see any passion. He never raised his voice. He never denounced the mansion or cinema, right? There was a reporter who came out with a book who got from people behind the scenes that Joe Biden had a meeting with Manchin at Manchin's behest because Manchin was pissed. Uh, Joe Biden is quoted as telling him, you know, I'm never going to make you feel uncomfortable. If you have principles, if you have a stance, I'm never going to uh, make you have to eat that, right? I'm going, you're going, I'm going to allow you to be Joe Manchin. So if that is your attitude going into the most powerful position in the country, if you're never going to say a harsh word, if you're never going to condemn the very people who hurt your voters, what are you there for? If you're only gonna come out with excuses for parliamentarians, then how can you say you stand for your firewall? How can you say you have the backs of black people, of Hispanics? If you can't even get pissed off, it has been half a century, right? Half a century since someone got up there and lost their lives because they had the nerve to say, we shouldn't have to live in poverty all our lives so that you can have your white picket fence. The system doesn't make sense. So 50 years have passed and we're actually worse. Obama didn't change it. He actually is responsible for black people losing more of their wealth than at any other time. And Wait a minute, say that, how would, would you say that one more time? Say what you just said. One it is a horrible, it is a horrible thing to have to say. I know it's horrible, but it's worse for if I say it. So yes. I want you to say it. So it is a horrible thing. And I will tell you what's more horrible. Obama is responsible for Black people as a Democratic Party losing their wealth as in no other time in modern history. No one went to jail. No one paid a price at the bank level for black people losing their homes, losing the wealth that they could have passed on to their children. It was gone. It's never been healed. But you know, we talk about reparations. It, we don't even have to go that far back. It was in the Obama administration. Studies have been done. Obama appointed, what was his name? Obama appointed its attorney. 
who was a well-respected Barofsky. And Barofsky. Eric Holder? Sorry? Eric Holder, is that who you're talking about? No, it, this Barofsky was in charge of the program called HAMP, H-A-M-P. HAMP was the program that Obama put out there to keep his promise to Congress. Enough Democrats got together to tell Obama, we are not giving you any money, more money for the bailout unless you promise us that you're not just going to help the banks. You need to help the ordinary homeowner. You need to help them. So in response to Congress, this faction of Congress putting this to Obama, he said, okay, we are going to help, we're going to use $50 billion to help the distressed homeowner who's ready, who is in the process of getting foreclosed on, or they're heading down that path. 50 billion, I think it eventually went up to 75 billion. Barofsky basically snitched on Obama because Barofsky was there to make sure that the HAMP program worked and it didn't. When Barofsky got in there to monitor things, to look over things, what he saw was that the people in control of the Obama administration's bailout program were all Wall Street people. They were all from Goldman Sachs. And what they said to Borofsky was, do chill out. What we're really here to do is foam the runway. So the idea of the Goldman Sachs people in Obama's administration was to take care of the big banks and that it was only window dressing. Whatever we did to help the ordinary homeowner who was trying not to lose their house, it was really window dressing and it was to get money out there in the economy, but that wasn't the focus. So the end result of Obama's HAMP program was that of the $50 billion that we had to help ordinary people, workers, people of color, just ordinary Joes, you know, was that we, we spent like a small fraction. I think at the time Borowski came out with his book, it was like $2 billion out of $50 billion. So Obama had the power, he had the money, and he promised Congress he would use that money to help ordinary people. So Obama didn't need to be Malcolm X. He didn't even need to be Martin Luther King. He just needed to keep his promise to use $50 billion under the HAMP program, an official program to help homeowners, not the bank, homeowners. He just didn't do it. He used it because they, And I think that's what I say in terms of getting people to support Dr. West. Because I always get the question of, well, how do you know? Dr. West has been an advocate for the working poor. That's what I'll call everybody. The working poor for yeah. like since I was 10. Yes. Since I was 10 years old. Probably probably my entire life, but I'm just going to give him 40 years. 40 yeah. years he's been advocating for this. It it would shock me, literally, if he just got in there and said, eh, I, I changed my mind. Yes. It happened, but I don't think it's going to happen in this case. And that's because one of the things I like about Dr. West's campaign is he wants his supporters to make him accountable for what he's saying. Yes. I don't really, I have never heard Joe Biden say, hey, hold me accountable. Make, no. me, make me do what I say I'm going to do. No, what he does is you show up to a meeting, he berates you and says, oh, yes. it's not the time. And all this bs -ery, that he comes up with, and I'm like, I see the point that I've made to do with this show is we keep voting for the Democrats and Republicans and expecting things to change. They right. won't. It's us right. that has to change. Right. It's the way that we vote right. has to change. We have right. to put a scare in the two party system. We gotta scare. We gotta scare them so much. Thank you. That yeah. they're like, oh my goodness. And I think, even though some people say, oh, well, if he gets elected, he won't do anything, I beg to differ. Because yeah. he knows he has the bully pulpit. He's willing to engage the public when things don't legislatively work. And I'm like, well, he can't appoint anybody. Yes, he can. Just call everybody active. 
Right. Acting Secretary of State, acting transportation. He's not going to get his agenda through. Right. And he can hold every time, and this is what I keep telling people about the bully pulpit. When the President of the United States opens his or eventually someday hers mouth, somebody's going to be covering it. Yeah. I don't care if it's the peanut butter press. I don't care if it's the Wall Street Journal. When the president speaks, people will, somebody will cover it. Absolutely. And yeah. I I know that Trump and Biden both know they have that power. Absolutely. They choose not to use it, but I believe that Dr. West would. Yeah. If that's making any sense, because I, I mean, would... you know, one of the things I kind of witnessed at the beginning after Cornell West announced his run for the presidency is I noticed a lot of people, white people, well-meaning white people, talk about how, one way or another, they were basically saying that Cornell West wasn't presidential enough. They would talk about his unkempt hair or his the emotional manner of his speaking, things like that. And I it made me realize that we've been kind of groomed to believe, whether we want to admit it or not, think about it. We've been groomed to believe that the the actors on the presidential stage, the white guys, you know, or the, the corporate guys um that that's the way to be presidential but they have failed us and you, yeah. you very rarely hear them talk with any kind of authenticity even obama to me actually sounded like uh, someone who had practiced rhetoric all his life which he had um when cornell west speaks he is actually talking like a preacher because he comes from an authentic place you know so i think that cornell west as is actually people poo poo it because he, you know, supposedly he has no political background, no background in business. That's a plus because what we have exactly. there, the, that's oh, what we have there in the heart of a man, an actual man, a real human being in his DNA is someone who believes what he's talking about and talks only about what he believes. And that is what we need as a leader because we are drowning in, in, authenticity. We are drowning in false propaganda and false messaging where people are used as symbols and people suffering is, is used as a symbol. We need the real thing. We need someone who says, exactly. we need someone who says, this is a corrupt system. Some well-meaning people are in that system. We feel we have no choice but to go along with the system. I'm calling it a new day. We need to get back to integrity. We need to get back to real morality. We need to actually start helping real ordinary Americans, not the guys who will never suffer because they're like they're drowning in money, right? They're never going to suffer. Not the professional class, the real people who who are the backbone of this country. He's done it all his life. When Obama was using hat money for symbolism to pretend he was helping out, you know struggling Americans, what he was doing was helping out Goldman Sachs. Cornell West was there. Cornell West called him out. Cornell West had hope for Obama. Cornell West had hope for Clinton. He's not like some crazy radical. He's always held out hope for the Democratic Party. But he's always been willing to call out their failures. And so he called out Obama's and Clinton's eventually. And he got a lot of flack from it. The media just gave uh, Cornell West and Tavis Smiley, they did their poverty tour. They came out with a book even. I mean, Cornell West was talking about the omission of the word poverty from Obama's rhetoric. From It just never came out of his mouth. It only came out of Obama's mouth when there was a lot of talk from the um, the 1% movement, I forget what it was called. The Occupy movement, right? The Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah. Yes, thank you. When that came out, Obama finally started saying, you know, we have a problem, but he never did anything. Your president, he never, 
He never had a policy that actually did anything. The one policy he had, Kent, was it. And he basically frittered it away. Well, if you're talking about a president that bailed out the bank, which I would have just let him fail. I'm like, oh well, it's ca if we're in a capitalistic society, which I think you're you're the back the sign in back you pretty much say is capitalism Thank doesn't you. work. Thank if, you. If that's the type of system we let him fail. That's what that's, that's what you that's what you're right. saying. I didn't say it, you said it. That is the free market. But but every president has done that. Every president. Um, of course, I was a child when Carter was president. I was like six when Reagan was president. So those two, I don't have a whole lot of memory. So, so I'm just going to start from Clinton because that's when I became eligible. To, they've all done that. Yeah. And you know who's been there the whole time? Joe Biden. Yes. Crime bill. Plagiarizing. Yes. Inappropriate actions with women, allegedly. He's been there the whole time. The whole time this man has been in politics my entire life. Yes. And I can't name one thing that he by himself has achieved. People are going to say he gave prescription drug relief. Two problems with that. One, it starts five years from now. And it only applies to people who are 60. Yes, you lowered the price of insulin. But that only works if you're 65 and you got to wait a couple more years before it takes that. Right. What you're supposed to do now. Diabetics need insulin now, not then. Yes. This man literally said, if Medicare for all gets to my desk, a policy that has been proven to lower health care costs, proven to be cheaper than what we have now. If it gets to my desk, I veto it. And I'm supposed to vote for that? No, it, it, it doesn't work like that for me. Let, it, let, me, say, let me say something following that. What he did say as a, you know, a corporate slave, as a slave to Washington, which Obama had also said. So they, could, they can't go as far as Medicare for all, but the public option is something that is used as a soundbite to say, okay, we can't do the, how will we pay for it extreme stance of Medicare for all, but we can improve the affordable care act by adding in public option it would increase competition it would lower the premiums for people to have actual usable health care insurance after his campaign it completely has never been, been in it he was like what's a public option i never said that <laughs> I, never, I mean he was too busy challenging um his own supporters to push-ups stop i mean people i'm like have you ever seen Cornell West say, you know what, let's go outside and do some push-ups right now, let's go. You never see, you're ne let me tell you something, I don't know Dr. West personally, I can guarantee you he's not going to challenge a supporter or a detractor to push up. I'm yeah. pretty sure he's not going to do it. Yeah. Joe Biden threatens to punch somebody in the face, Democrats are okay with it. Yeah. It's another one that I got to point out, because if I don't, I want to tell everybody, I am not black. Because I didn't vote for Joe Biden. He literally said, if you vote for Donald Trump, you ain't black. And we just let him slide. How? He is the man that literally told the NAACP. He went to an NAACP rally and said, if you vote Republican, they'll have you in chains. We have let the Republican Party get away. We have let the Democratic Party, especially, get away with way too much. Absolutely. I'm tired of it. It doesn't make any sense. If Trump had said, if Trump had said, yeah, I'm going to put you in chains, we would all just be like, he did not say that. He needs to go. Rightfully so. That would be the right thing to say. But because a Democrat does it, oh, it's okay. He's, he's 80. He didn't. Mean, what do you mean? This was the whole, he called LL Cool J the rapper boy. And I was like, he, well, he apologized. He didn't, he never apologized. Watch, did he come back and say, hey, LL, or whatever his real name is, I'm sorry I called you a boy. No, he didn't. He said, man, like a couple of seconds later, oh, well, he's 80. 
So that makes it okay that he called an African-American male a boy? Yeah. The worst term besides the N-word. Yeah. Besides the N-word. Yes. That's when you just, we let too many things slide. And when I say Absolutely. we, I'm, I'm specifically talking about I'm not Puerto Rican, I'm not white, I'm not Asian, I'm black, period. We have let the Democratic Party slide, and it's time we make them pay. And we make them pay by voting for somebody who actually does have our back, who does have our interests in mind. And not only Black interests, Dr. West cares about the indigenous, um, what I call the rainbow community, the working poor. There's not a community that he's not concerned about. Always. And that's what I want. I can't take any more of either we're going to get World War III with Trump. No, we're going to either get World War III with, with Biden or a civil war with Trump. Yeah. When are we going to stop all of this? I mean, See, you said it better. We have increased the military budget every single year. Yeah. We've given Ukraine billions. And I mean billions, but we have homelessness. Oh, it's not the same thing. They allocate. Okay, so why don't you allocate money for the homeless, right? Yeah. We are just letting these two parties get away with just anything. And it's just like, we've got to put a stop to this. And, you know, it It only gets worse. The, I mean, I actually feel like it never stops. It, it, the depravity, the degeneracy keeps getting worse. We're we're still witnessing the just the just the indescribable treatment of Palestinians in Gaza, who are being slaughtered as a result of our tax money, our bonds, our support of Israel. Our munitions, our technology is being used to kill babies. The children, just just children. Since we always have this idea, well, you must be supporting Hamas. Let's put that aside. Just children. 10,000 children have been slaughtered with Biden barely bothering to work up a sweat. Right? Uh, he was to call for a ceasefire. Yeah. They asked them, uh, what are, what are, what's the chances of us getting Israel to do a ceasefire? And he says, none, no possibility. And then now because the bodies keep piling up, the dead babies keep piling up, now he's sending signals that he's in talks with Israel and it gets, it just keeps getting worse. It is and insane. You know the solution to that is fairly easy and i'm glad dr west said this too stop giving them money yeah. if you don't do a ceasefire we're not giving you money i guarantee those bombings will yeah. stop i i guarantee it oh yeah. you can't him calling for a ceasefire means nothing then because yeah. israel is they know they're going to get the money from the u.s they can count on it they can count on it it's like it's yeah. guaranteed him calling for a ceasefire now is just window dressing but if you say, I'm going to stop your money, oh, that'll, that, I guarantee there won't be any more bombing of hospitals. But of course, there's APAC. APAC. I don't even want to talk about APAC because I get angry when I talk about APAC. The fact that they use religion because they, they really are, they're really perverting yeah. the Jewish religion. Not that I'm Jewish, but that's what I believe that they're doing to make all of these insane Absolutely. arguments. Absolutely. But if um, he, if he thinks that's gonna make him more electable, it's not. He no. You think of disabled Puerto Ricans. The Democratic Party lost votes. Haitian migrants. The Democratic Party lost votes. The Arab community. The Democratic Party lost votes. They make it viscerally on the gut level impossible for supposedly traditional demographics who back the Democratic Party. They make it impossible for these voters to go to the polls. For me to vote for Joe Biden, I would be voting for the Wall Street guys 
you know, in their suit and tie, who get to go on vacations, who have health care. I'm voting for them over my crippled auntie who she's passed away now, but she lived her life in crutches and wheelchairs. When she got to the States, when she was in Puerto Rico, she had to be carried around as an adult. How can I do that? How, really, someone tell me how, as a Puerto Rican, I can vote for Biden when he treated my people like trash. If you're Haitian and you are aware that he's broken all Democratic Party records for you know, disposing of Haitian migrants in this way, basically sentencing them to death. How can you vote for Biden? If you're Arab and you watch the TV for just a minute and you know that there are 10,000 babies and dead babies in Gaza that used to be alive, that used to have a, a life in front of them, they're dead. And Biden couldn't even be bothered to say a harsh word, not one harsh word from that man. That's lost voters. This is insanity. And there's no doubt that the Democratic Party will continue to function whether they win or lose in the next election. They're okay with this. Who are the luminaries of the party who have really gotten up there and gotten the microphone in front of their face and say, this is crazy, right? So you're, you are correct. The only way people say we have to stop Trump. Well, I say we need to stop the insanity and it's both parties. And the way you do that is yes, you are correct, Tracy. Make them afraid. They are not ever going to get elected. They will lose voters, including voters of color because enough is enough. I don't want another 10,000 dead babies on my conscience. I feel humiliated that because of the vote blue, no matter who I voted for Biden, and we have, I have 10,000 dead babies on my conscience. I have betrayed disabled Puerto Ricans living in the most poverty stricken place in America on my conscience. I voted for Biden. So, the only way for things to change is someone who has the nerve, like Cornell West, to say, I'm standing for integrity, I'm standing for truth, I'm standing for actual justice. He's like really the only guy I can vote for. And it, if, if Cornell West disappears for whatever reason, I have no place to go as a voter. I have no home, like I have no political home. It's not even about ideology to me anymore. It's about simple human decency and honesty. Because I know Biden is an inherently dishonest man. It, it doesn't even matter what he says anymore. We all have proof in, in, on a host of issues that he simply lies and then he adds a lie to cover up the lie. You cannot trust the man. I can't trust Trump. I can't trust Biden. The, the two parties systemically are inherently corrupt. I have no place to go but uh, Cornell West. And yeah. I know, we know, everyone knows, unless you scare these parties, the Democratic Party in particular, because they always hold up the, the claim to hold the some no, nobility, right? a virtue signal, they use yep. people of color. They have to be scared. They, there's no other way it will ever change. I don't think they will, but as a matter of personal ethics, I know that there is no other play but to simply not vote for them. I tell my friends who are still democratic voters, I say, I, I tell them what happened in Puerto Rico. None of these people have ever denounced people I know, people who know I'm Puerto Rican, None of them have ever said, Jose, you're right. This is a shame. What do we do about it? I'm going to write the New York Times a letter. I'm going to denounce Biden. The party has to change. They never say that. So these, I tell these people, okay, when you vote for the Democratic Party, please know this. I have voted for the party all my life. I have been a proud voter of Democrats, especially who are people of color. I voted for them. And that hasn't been enough. The party is still the party. 
the party covered up for Joe Biden. So tell your people, you should know, I'm a lifelong straight Democratic Party ticket voter. Always done it, and I can no longer vote for the party. I am simply incapable of voting for the party. And there are other voters like me. There are black voters, Haitian voters, you know, Arab voters, they're working class voters. There are millions of people who have been alienated. Obama lost, I think, 4 million voters from his first term to his second. He lost 4 million voters because some voters could see that he was bailing out Wall Street, but not ordinary Americans. So it's a real historical phenomenon. The Democratic Party does, you know, it seesaws back and forth. One administration is GOP, one is Democratic Party. It barely gets by, right? People voted for Biden, not because they loved him, but because they were, they either hated Trump or they feared Trump's ascendancy. So they voted for Biden just as a matter of pragmatism, they claim. So something should have happened during this administration to show us voters, reluctant Biden voters, that things were going to change from the Biden administration on. Something systemically in the party was going to change. It got worse. Oh, I, I did a video last week where I, I, I really laid out why I, I don't think, one, I don't think Biden's going to, I don't think he's going to be the Democratic nominee at this point. I really don't. I can't see it. But right. it doesn't matter who the Democratic Party is, because as an entire party, they're terrible. Yes. The Republican Party, they were already terrible. They, 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 they just are. They're terrible. They don't care. No, I don't, I don't even in my mind think about the Republican Party, because they basically just campaign on issues that don't even make sense. to. I mean, they use social issues to, like they don't matter to me. Well, the Democrats yeah. doesn't matter to me. Same but here. in terms of, you know, increasing the military budget, giving big pharma breaks, the fact that big pharma tells you that they won't negotiate prices and you have to pay them. No, no, it doesn't work like that. We tell you what you're gonna pay and you either take it or we stop giving you research money. Do your own research. It it, it just it, it's why I did this show because I want to do my little small part in telling people it's a new day. It's a new day. We don't have to keep voting against our own interests. Right. Go to CornellWest2024.com and read the platform. Read the platform and you tell me if either Trump has a policy like that or Biden has a policy like that. Matter of fact, there is the, if you go to Joe Biden's site, like I did last week, and you look for a platform, you're not going to find it. There's no platform on his reelection page. Trump has these platitudes of, I'm just going to go after my enemies. That's what you want. That's literally what you want. So I invite everybody to go to Cornell West 2024.com. And when you see this video, the link will be in the description section and the tag will be running across the video and look at the platform and literally ask yourself, is Joe Biden or um, Donald Trump for this? Are they calling for a $27 minimum wage? Are they talking about abolishing poverty? Are they talking about community banks getting out of NATO? Well, Trump talks about getting out of NATO, but he you knows that man lies every time he opens his mouth. Is he? Are, do either one of them have the platform that Dr. West has? No, they don't. Like I said, that platform, Dr. West's platform to me is the strongest that I have ever read. And I've been a registered voter a long time. And I'm going to continue to show my support. And of course, we always want to encourage everybody to go to that same website, CornellWest2024.com, and drop a donation. I know the campaign's not asking me to do this, but I'm asking you to do this because campaigns need money. We don't have fine publicly financed elections. 
Not going to go into that whole discussion. I know we should, but we don't. It takes money to run, especially against these two. So chip in your $5, your $10, your $1, and let's get this thing started. And hope uh, that you want to say something. I, I would add, you know, yes, look at the platform. I, Trump and Biden are incoherent human beings. They are wind socks, right? They're going to say whatever seems to have traction in the corporate media, right? They're going to say whatever, you know, as a demagog demagogic technique, whatever kind of harnesses people's emotion, their non thinking, their fears. I don't think they have principle in any cell of their body. It's just whatever, right? Whatever might possibly fool people, they're going to try. If you actually read the body of work of Cornell West, it's the same guy. It, he has been, his stances on issues have been the same, and he's laid them out in, in great detail. And the dude is a corny guy, and I say this in terms of his belief system is basically classic, Western civilization, the idea of thinking, the idea of supporting your positions with logical argument backed up by evidence and fact. So when he talks like this, people, you know, it almost sounds like a foreign language because we are no longer used to being uh, thinkers, skeptical thinkers, right? In the classic sense, that's Cornell West. He's a professor. So he's always stood for that. And then over overlaying that is he believes in this idea of decency amongst men and women. And he understands that as social justice proponents, African Americans have always been at the forefront, right? It's not a pie in the sky stuff. It's just they've been on the front lines because they've have been trying to survive in this country forever. And so the result of that is that you've had, he calls them prophetic thinkers, people who have had to go on the front line, had to leave their comfort zone, had to leave you know, safety, had to risk their life to simply speak the truth. And they've done it. And we still have them. We have Reverend Barber, who has constantly begged Biden to please keep us poor people in mind. Please speak up for, for us. It hasn't happened. Cornell West has simply always done this. It's been his life's work, right? He wakes up in the morning and he's, you know, 30 years ago and now waking up now and it's going to be the same thoughts, the same position, the same stances of integrity, you know, so he's been the same guy. If you go back in Biden's personal history, you see degeneracy. You see an ability and a willingness and a weaponization of lies. He simply has always lied. You know, Senator Warnock invited Joe Biden to MLK's church. Biden got up there and he started to repeat lies that got him booted out of his first presidential campaign. We are no longer the same country. We don't hold politicians to account. Biden plagiarized and lied about being uh, a civil rights worker in the 1980s, and that's why, why he had to drop his campaign for president. He got into Senator Warnock's church, and he started repeating that he was raised in the Black church, that he was in the civil rights movement, that he marched, right? So he, he went way back and started repeating this lie, and I've looked because it really bugs me. Biden is an attorney. When attorneys lie like this in court, they get condemned, they get censured, they get disbarred. Biden is an attorney. He knows better. He's repeated the civil rights activism lies all his life, and he repeated them in King's Church. It just hurts me to my soul that not one single person in the Democratic Party not one Democratic voter that I personally know has condemned that. It, he just did it. 
and it passed. He's not head. Trump. He's not Trump, and that's what we want everybody to. Oh my God! Stop saying. And in conclusion, again, go to CornellWest2024.com because until we vote different, we won't get different. We have to support Dr. West. That's a period exclamation point. We've got to. We have no choice. Jose said it better than I could. We have no choice. We have, you know, we have some good candidates in the independent realm for president, except for RSK Jr. But Dr. West stands head and shoulders above the rest in terms of what he believes and what he's done in his activism. So give it a give it a check out. Like I said, pitch in your one, two, three, four, five dollars, and let's get Dr. West in the White House. Let's make history. List on January 2025. Let's all plan to go to D.C. and throw the biggest "We Told You So" party, and let's just get Dr. West elected president of the United States. Join me. Um, you all will see this in January. Hopefully, I will get a guest each week, but I don't know if that's going to happen. So the plan is to have somebody in February um, to come on. So thank you all for joining. Again, none of my links will be in the description section. It will only be about Dr. West. Um, so support his campaign financially. Get out volunteer definitely volunteer um we the campaign needs your help i'm pretty sure they won't strangle me for saying that and we'll support that thank you have a great day